very, very good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, first of all, thank you very much to Future Water Association for inviting me to this uh, annual award. I feel very honored to be here and uh, very pleased actually to be here. Um, I was asked to talk about water and space and uh, water and space, we could be talking the whole evening. So I decided to select uh, some of the things uh, which are related to water and space, which I hope uh, you find interesting and uh, let me start by saying that I work at the European uh, Space Agency and I just wanted uh, to mention that this is uh, our logo. This is, uh, by the way, a picture taken from the International Space Station, that's European Space Agency. You can see UK, uh, it is there. So there is no discussion about the membership of UK in ESA. It is a founder member and will remain there for, for many years. Actually, UK, it is the third contributor of ESA in the total budget and we are really privileged uh, to have uh, industry from UK, uh, space industry, uh, university researchers and scientists and climate change and water for example we have excellent groups uh, in in UK. So when we talk about the space and, and water uh, uh, the first thing that come, came to my mind is obviously uh, the monitoring of our planet uh, where water is an essential ingredient and uh, this is uh, one of the highest priority for us Actually, not many people know, but uh, when you look at the budget of the European Space Agency, that you can see that here, we have an annual budget as uh, 6.68 billion euros, and you can see the split uh, among the different uh, programs, uh, robotic exploration, navigation, uh, science, but you can see that Earth observation, actually uh, observing our planet, is taking 23% of the whole budget of ESA. And uh, this is because our planet is the most important thing and we need a space to actually monitor it. Um, you can see here the, the different programs we have for observing the Earth from space at uh, the European Space Agency. We have a very large meteorological problem with many connections with water, obviously. Uh, Meteosat, second, third generation and the METOP which are polar orbiting satellites. Uh, we have a, a large uh, scientific program uh, also in Earth observation with several satellites uh, there uh, linked to water. For example, ESMOS here, it is studying the cycle water. Um, we have Cryosat, for example, studying in detail uh, the ice on the planet Earth and uh, several uh, of them are related to water. And then we have the large uh, Copernicus program. This is the largest uh, program in the world for monitoring the planet and it is obviously uh, connected to climate change. We have launched a total of eight uh, Sentinel satellites so far. We have more than 10 uh, planned for this decade. As I mentioned, the largest program of observing the Earth and we should be quite proud of it. So we are observing our planet uh, in all dimensions, atmosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere, obviously all linked to water, uh, biosphere, um, the Earth interior, the lithosphere and also assessing what we call the anthropogenic efforts, uh, the way the human beings are impacting actually our planet and our climate. And all that is related to, to climate change, uh, which is a top priority of our programs. And uh, actually we are following what is called monitoring a large number of essential climate variables. I think there are a total of 54 essential climate variables and you need satellites uh, to monitor those globally, at least 50% of those and uh, many of them are related to water and you know then um, the sea level, uh, the sea ice variations, the sea surface temperature, who is this marine, the color of the oceans, the chlorophyll, uh, the contamination, pollution of our oceans, the ice sheet, the soil moisture, for example, the salinity, all those are, are monitored and you see here uh, some examples uh, of maps that we are producing, uh, sea surface temperature, uh, soil moisture, as I mentioned, uh, sea level variations. Uh, actually, all that is related to, to the global warming and uh, we know well the greenhouse effects are there. We don't have a plan B as was noted today. Uh, this is uh, the most important planet in the universe for us and the, the reasonable place um, to really take care. Uh, you see the variation increasing on the carbon dioxide above 400 parts per million. I remember in the year 2000, this was considered a figure which was like the, the, the really the disaster figure and we are really above that. And the problem is that the derivative is increasing and the second derivative is also increasing. So this is really a very serious one. And obviously related to water, the, the obvious connection is the, the sea level variation and 
you can see here the statistics of the last uh, 30 years, which we are tracking every year from satellites, from different satellites is a priority with variations in average of 3.2 millimeters per year. But you can see there are areas in the world, for example, in the South Atlantic reaching 10 millimeters per year, which means uh, which could reach uh, one meter in 100 years, which means literally uh, the disappearance of islands and the coastals and where many, many of the people are living as you know. So it's a really serious problem as we know. And just wanted to, to note here, we launched the last satellite we have launched at TISA is called Sentinel-6A. Uh, this was launched on the 21st of November this year. And uh, just I wanted to mention that uh, this has an altimeter, what you can see here, and it is a satellite fully dedicated to the study of the oceans and in particular the, the ocean's topography, uh, the sea level uh, variation and the wave height. So you can see uh, it is a top priority uh, for us. If we go above from the Earth, the next obvious connection is the International Space Station, uh, which is 400 kilometer height, uh, 28,000 kilometers per hour in orbit. Um, we have an important contribution from the European Space Agency and water. Obviously, it is an essential element there. Uh, starting from the training of our astronauts, you can see Team Peak, our great UK astronaut, uh, which is training in water, actually. Uh, it is training for what we call extravehicular activities. You can see, for example, here in the Johnson Space Center in Houston in NASA, a replica of the International Space Station. So our astronauts are doing what we call extravehicular activity training. Uh, it's the best way we can emulate uh, the lack of gravity and uh, you can... Uh, move uh, heavy weights here and uh, that's the way we do it. Uh, water is here helping, but obviously water in the station, it is essential for the survival and, and it is very expensive. I put here the question, how much it costs to bring one liter of water to the ISS? So let me tell you a lot, and a lot means around $10,000. That's the price it brings to bring one liter of water. It's a kilogram and we need a special cargo. That's why we have, um, we do everything as possible uh, to recycle uh, the water. And this is a fundamental research on the International Space Station together with science. It's everything related to life support and in particular to water recycling. 80% of the water of the International Space Station is recycling. Actually, astronauts are drinking uh, exhaled breath from other astronauts, which is recycled and uh, uh, sweat from other astronauts and other things that you can imagine, uh, obviously uh, purify with these uh, devices, which are later on payback, by the way, on the Earth, uh, on the uh, sustainable goal number six related to water. Uh, if we go beyond the international space stations, the next station is um, the moon. And uh, uh, there also, uh, there are big connections. We are going to the moon, as you all know. Um, we are going and Europe is, will be a fundamental player. And uh, we are very happy ESA, uh, also with a large contribution from UK. What you can see here is the Orion uh, spacecraft. This is the way the astronauts uh, will reach the, the moon orbit. Um, we have here what is called the service model, which is providing actually the water uh, to the astronauts, the oxygen, uh, the life support, and also um, the propulsion. So it is really very nice. And uh, you can see here a small video showing uh, the uh, Orion, um, which again, it will be the way we will be back to the moon uh, together with NASA. Um, you know, since 1973, not a single human being has been out of the Earth orbit. So this is nice that this is happening again, and this will happen during this decade um, very, very soon. In the, in the moon, we will have also a permanent uh, station, a similar setup, uh, internationally set up as we had in the International Space Station, obviously smaller. This is called Gateway. It is in cis lunar orbit, and we will have uh, also important contribution from the European Space Agency. From there, we will have astronauts going to the moon and back. And the idea is to have a permanent uh, a presence of the humans on the moon, and their water plays uh, another fundamental role. We need water to live, to drink. We need water to generate oxygen for, for breathing. And we need also water for the fuel of our rockets and maybe also water to protect against radiation. So it is nice to know that there is quite some, some water on the moon. Uh, you maybe heard the news uh, last October, the publication in Nature, Astronomy, uh, saying that there is around 20% more water than we thought uh, on the moon. 
And um, that's really great because we can use this water. This water is not only in the shadow areas, but also on the sunlight areas. It's so really nice and uh, not expected. And uh, there is a connection between the solar wind and the regolith, uh, which allows to have water uh, there, which we, will, we could use really for the future. Uh, the next destination after the moon is Mars. And uh, we will go to Mars probably the next decade, 2030, 2040. But before we go with human beings, we will go with um, robotic missions. And there is again a fundamental connection with water because as we know, we have clear evidence uh, that water was very frequent on Mars 3.5 billion years ago and in a conditions which were very similar to the way uh, there was the Earth on that time where, where life originated. So we believe uh, if the same condition happened, if water was infrequent, so probably life also happened in Mars. So that's the key question we are going. By the way, there is today water is still in ice in Mars, but there is also liquid water uh, in the underneath of the polars. We have seen uh, liquid water, lakes of water, very death. And you can ask how it is possible that there is water with such a low temperature. And this is because of the pressure and also because of the different salinities which help uh, to keep it uh, liquid. Okay, so the question is whether there is life now or whether life has protected under, under the surface. We know life is incompatible in the surface because of the radiation today, but in those areas uh, where, there's, where there was water, we are looking in the interior of that and we are launching a mission in ESA called Mars 2022. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, that's the, the, the rubber, and we will have biological uh, activity. And uh, let me say that water is very frequent also in, in the solar system. We have asteroids uh, with water, we have uh, uh, comets with water, and we believe the connection of, with the water of the Earth is coming from there. But there is also very nice connection with um, uh, our moons, icy moons uh, in uh, Saturn, like Enceladus, and the icy moons in Jupiter. Uh, we have clear evidence that there are oceans uh, under the icy crust. Uh, you see the picture here or an image of uh, Enceladus. Uh, you see the plumes, um, uh, the geysers uh, that are in the South Pole. And it is very nice. So we have a model today, uh, which is more or less like the one you see in this image, around 65 kilometers of water uh, and a kind of ocean. Uh, after the icy shell of five kilometers. And what is very nice here is that through a spectrometry, we have discovered the components that you can see, molecular uh, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane. And it is wise because it is exactly what we could expect if there is microbiological life uh, under, under this water. You know, in the Earth, in the abyssal areas of the oceans, without the impact of the sun, which is not reaching there, we have uh, biological life, which is actually eating uh, molecular hydrogen and carbon dioxide and is producing methane as a byproduct. And this is exactly what we are observing. So it's fascinating that life could be there. Uh, we are going to Jupiter. We have a mission called JUICE uh, in 2022. And we will in particular analyze uh, Europa, Ganymedes and Calixto. And Europa has similar conditions to uh, Enceladus. So it is extremely interesting from the astrobiological point of view. Um, if we go beyond the, the solar system and uh, the next connection is really with uh, the exoplanets and also connection with life. Uh, we have already more than 400, 300 exoplanets confirmed, uh, uh, several thousands in the waiting list. Uh, more than 3,000 planetary systems. We know now that exoplanets are in every star, but we are able to have statistics. We are looking for those, especially which are in what we call the habitable area, which means the area where water can be in a liquid state. That's where we are interested. And let me tell you that we are have a large flotilla of satellites uh, in Europe going there uh, to study exoplanets. It started with CHEOPS, which was launched last year. But we will have James Webb Space Telescope, which will be fundamental for exoplanet research with a fundamental contribution from Europe together with NASA. Um, we have PLATO 2026 and Ariel. Ariel is very nice. It will allow to explore uh, the atmospheres of these exoplanets. And again, here we have a nice connection with water because uh, when we look to these atmospheres of those uh, planets, uh, which can be in the habitable area, uh, we are looking to those ingredients in the infrared spectrum, which we can assess with those satellites. O ozone, oxygen, uh, methane, carbon dioxide, and of course, water. Water vapor is a clear biomarker. If we have those, 
in one of these exoplanets, uh, we can have a clear evidence that there is biological activity, and this is a rich, if you allow me to say, uh, during this decade. So let me finish with this image. Um, uh, you is showing even beyond the, uh, our galaxy as we go beyond, and we go beyond in time. This is an image of 12 billion years ago, um, and this is a quasar, a quasar APM. And I show you that because uh, here on the early universe, uh, water was already very, very frequent, and it is now. In this particular uh, quasar, we have estimated there are about 140 trillion times the water of the Earth already around uh, this quasar, which shows, as I mentioned, water is a fundamental ingredient of our universe from the very beginning and certainly now. I finish with the image of our planet Earth. There is no plan B. I hope that the conference in Glasgow next year will have a fundamental step in the direction to really preserve and water is the key element uh, in this. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure being here. Javier, wow. <laughs> that was absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you very much. I mean, one of, one of the questions actually, I think it's worth um, just, just raising this, one of the questions that's, that's, that's being posed is how vital is water, especially given your last comment, and do, is, is water seen as being absolutely essential to life elsewhere? And, and if there isn't water, then we can't really define life in other parts of the universe. That's a very nice question for astrobiologists, which I'm not astrobiology, but I can tell you the, the, the basics. So today our reference of life, it is our way of living, our life, based on amino acids and based on carbon. And uh, that's what we know for life. That's the only model we have. So uh, we believe uh, we are not special. So the same should happen everywhere else. And then for our existence, for our uh, model of life, water is absolutely necessary. Yes, so we say always that for the search of life, there are three ingredients we should look for. Uh, one is water, number one. The second is uh, uh, complex organic material. And the third one is a source of energy. The three together, we think, is the universe worth the way we think life is unavoidable when you have the three. So exactly water is a key one. So those of us in the water sector should be working with those of you across across the field of uh, space and, 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 and the space agencies. I, I, I think it's, um, it's so fundamental to everything that we do. And you, you very kindly reference not just climate change, but the S SGD6. So it's, it really is critical to so much of the way we are as, as people. And, and you also mentioned the need for water and the importance of water in, in terms of travel to say Mars. And that indicates that water clearly in, in the atmosphere has a huge element of protecting us from various forms of radiation that come towards the planet. Yeah, actually, yeah, water is uh, simply uh, everything for us. I wanted to mention uh, uh, there is clear connection between our space community and your community, and you know it well. Um, there are many things you could do. You know, one of the things we try at ESA is uh, out of, uh, to be a little bit out of our natural uh, uh, groups and to talk to other people. That's why I'm here, because we are believe there are plenty of uh, spin-in uh, possibilities and spin-off. Uh, and uh, the clear example here is the life support systems, as, as you see. So to, to have water in the ISS, we need to really do ingenious things uh, to, to purify the water. Uh, we have to do, uh, and those immediately apply to, 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 to the Sustainable Goal 6, to many industries. But there are many ways also you can ingenious uh, on the ways you can keep water, on the ways you can generate water, on the ways uh, we can extract water from the moon, uh, uh, whether water could be used for radiation protection. I am convinced your industry has a say in there. So we are very pleased to have newcomers and I am inviting your industry to also have, why not, uh, a research component to water and space. I, th I think that's fantastic. And that, <clears throat> that points to another question that was about how, how we could get more involved. And, and I think you've highlighted that and you've, you've, you've touched on it in ways you talk about the International Space Station and, and the way water is purified and recycled and even the vapor collected. Um, and. And just one um, quick question um, 
which might be a nice one to to sort of close on. The you mentioned water on the moon, and and thank you for highlighting why there is water on Mars when it's so cold. I, I understand. I put my science brain on, and I do understand the the pressure argument. Um, is there enough water on the moon to consider having a a um a base there? Is a is is there enough that would support a base that could be used for you know further space exploration that could be you know that that could house a certain number of people could be more more than the space station itself? Yeah, very good question, uh, Paul. Yeah, there is a lot of water in the moon. Uh, however, it's obviously it's not in lakes, so you need to be able to extract this water. It's not a, such a simple thing. But yes, there is a lot. And 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 the the last uh, research, as I mentioned, uh, we have found we thought the water was only in the shadow areas of the moon, because obviously there it is still icy, and we thought okay, there it is simply okay. It's maintained with these low temperatures. There is never the sun reaching those areas in the craters. But the last the nice discovery is that there is also water in the sunlight. And as I mentioned, apparently the mechanism, the, the water has to be continually generated. It cannot remain because with the sun, we should disappear. Uh, apparently there is a mechanism continually generating water. Uh, and more or less what I understood is connected with the solar wind. Uh, the solar wind uh, hydrogen is interacting. Um, uh, the solar wind actually is interacting with the regolith. Uh, the regolith of the moon uh, has oxygen. So the hydrogen and the oxygen combine, and then uh, the water is generated. And then the micrometeorites also play some nuclear reactions in that process, and then water is continually there. So yes, there is a lot of water, and now the technologies we are assessing is how to extract this water and how to have it there on a permanent basis. So, you know, one fundamental thing of space is that we ask very difficult questions. So how to survive on the moon, how to strand the water there, how to live without, uh, with this heavy reaction and, and for example, uh, radiation. And these difficult questions has a tremendous challenge for scientists and engineers because we are solving a fine, nice problem. And this is the way we create innovation, which then pays back to the earth. A simple way of explaining why space research is so important. So I, again, your community for me is fundamental. I think you could work, many of your companies could work in the earth observation field, could help a lot. Uh, in having sensors on the earth, uh, in contributing to uh, getting the measurements of our water distribution for your industries as a kind of uh, also benefiting from this knowledge. We are creating a lot of economy, uh, not only protecting the earth, but also creating economy in the green way, thanks to our data. So I see plenty of connections and will be very nice. And I offer myself, Paul, uh, to help you. If some of you are interested to put you in the right connections with ISA for those people interested. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Javier, and, and thank you for, for that final comment. I, I, I think this, this is the start of a conversation and, and, it's, an, and it's a great one. And I'm, I'm personally, a, you know, a, 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 I would say astronomy is a hobby, but it's, it's probably more, more than that. So I think, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And can I say, I'm, I'm really happy to see the, the Sentinel program um, and, and, and the launch recently. The more data we have, we narrow the band over which politicians can object to things. And, and the way we talk about the, the, the impact on, on our oceans and the way the climate's changing, the more evidence we can put forward that stops politicians having any wriggle room, the better. So um, I, I think it's great to see the Sentinel uh, project pr progressing. Thank you, Javier. Thank you for your presentation and, and thank you for answering some questions. We couldn't get through all of them, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you the, the questions that have been asked. Great um, pleasure. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you.